این یک کشتار وضعیت قرمز است زمان انقلاب فرا رسیده The protests reached my small town within days of their outbreak in Kurdistan and only two days after, they erupted in Tehran. For several days, I was exposed to video recordings of the People's Street protests, the exciting songs and the photos and figures of women protesters. On Wednesday, I finally found myself amidst a street protest. The first moment of being there, in the street, surrounded by protesters, it was extremely strange. Only a day earlier, I had watched these protesters from behind a cell phone screen, marveling at their courage, choking up and weeping at their actions. I looked around me and tried to synchronize the images of the street with the reality of the street. What I saw firsthand was very similar to what I had previously viewed on a screen. In this street, you suddenly think that you should run and you realize that you have already begun to run. You say to yourself that you should light a cigarette and you see that you are there, among the people, smoking a cigarette. The body has moved faster than perception and the two have not yet synchronized. I even think that death is not frightening for a person who has experience being in the street. The experience of the street suspends thought about death. And this is what creates fear for observers, seeing people who are ready to die. We are ready to die. No. We're not even ready. We have been liberated from thinking about death. We have left death behind us in the intimacy of encountering our fears and running ahead of them in the warmth of the body. I once received loud cheers when I escaped a scene of confrontation with security forces and then I ran into the crowd. Walking home late at night, a passing motorcycle delivery man would flash a victory sign at me or shout encouragement. I was still preoccupied with the moment. I wasn't fully aware of the reason for the praise and the encouragement. The next morning, when I was looking over my bruises in the mirror, the details of the confrontation suddenly passed before my eyes. It was as if I had abruptly remembered a dream, a dream that a moment ago I was not aware I had seen. My body had cooled down and my mind had gotten to work. I had not simply been beaten. I had also resisted. I threw a few punches and kicks. My memory had just now, after a time interval, reached my body. For me, the palpable difference between this protest and the protests I had experienced before was a passage from the movement of a crowd to the creation of a situation. Each time, in the short interval before the arrival of the forces of repression, a gathering of protesters would form around a situation to create something. With the arrival of the forces, depending on the circumstances of the street and its surrounding alleys, the gathering would disperse after a confrontation only to reform a different location. These situations were created when the protesters blocked a street, burning a garbage disposal bin in the middle of the street and bringing traffic to a standstill. Within this short window of opportunity, the active but not so large crowd would rapidly attempt to create a situation. Now, let's burn the headscarves. A woman would jump on top of a trash bin, face the cars, lift up her fist, fixed in that figure for a few seconds. Another woman would jump on top of a car and wave her headscarf in the air. A few middle-aged women would stay with the nucleus of the group from beginning to end, rapidly moving to help release people when they were arrested. Everybody wanted to join the mass of images they had seen in protest videos from the previous days and from people in other cities. Very few people shouted slogans in these moments. I could clearly see this desire. 
to become that image, that image of resistance that the people of my city had seen in previous days. In what follows, I want to explore this same desire, to answer the question of what makes this a feminist revolution. As I wrote, these protests are not crowd-centered, but situation-centered, not a slogan-centered, but figure-centered. Anybody, and I really mean anybody, can create an unbelievable, radical situation of resistance by themselves, such that it astonishes the viewer. Belief in this, I can, this ability has spread very far. Everybody knows that they are creating an unforgettable situation with their figures of resistance. People, and especially women, these tenacious and headstrong seekers of their desires are going after this new desire hard. And this same desire increasingly drives forward a chain of stimulating further desires to create figures and situations of resistance. I want to be that woman with the figure of resistance, the one I saw in the photo, and I create a figure. These figures were already present in the unconscious of the protesters without ever having been practiced, as though they had been practicing them for years. This figure of resistance, this body recorded in images, becomes in later links of the stimulating chain of desires an incitement of other women's desire to strike their own figures. Oh, what desires have been released during these days from the prison house of our bodies, we women. I want to counterpose that vector of force that mobilized the crowd for the protests of 2009, for example. To these points of stimulation, the scattered and multiple points of arousal in the street, like the female orgasm. These points of stimulation are neither focused nor restricted to any point in the body. If I want to call this uprising a feminist uprising, I need to look for something beyond the starting point of the protests, the woman life freedom slogan and the call by women activists inside the country to the initial gathering. Beside all of these, what has extended this uprising in a feminine and feminist form and now arouses women's desires the world over is the plural figurative stimulation points in protesting bodies, figures that protesters visibly desire to become, such that it's no longer possible to go to the street without striking the figure of one of those disobedient, rebellious, resisting bodies. Whether it is on top of a car, on top of a trash bin, burning a headscarf, freeing a detained protester, or standing defiant before the forces of repression. The images we women have seen of other resisting women have granted us a new understanding of our bodies. I think that the singularity of these feminist resistance and its figurative character made it such that from the outset, what became iconic were screenshots and photographs rather than videos. Photographs were published on a mass scale that made us proud and were rapidly etched on our collective memory, such that one can write the chronology of this uprising through a history of the images published every day. Photographs that stimulated this uprising and drove it forward. The photo of Gina Massa Amini on the hospital bed. The photo of Gina's relatives holding each other in grief in the hospital. The image of Kurdish women in the Aichi cemetery waving their headscarves in the air. What we want to see of that entire event, that instant when the headscarves are suspended in their fluttering, their swaying in the air, the photograph of Gina's gravestone, 
the figure of the torch-bearing woman of Keshavar's boulevard, the figure of the woman standing solo in the street facing the water cannon in Valia's circle, the figure of the sitting woman, the figure of the standing woman, the figure of the woman carrying a sign in Tabriz, eye to eye with the forces of repression, the figure of the woman who ties her hair, the picture of the dance circle around a bonfire in Bandar Abbas, and so many others. These moments and figures are self-sufficient in representing the history of the repression of women's bodies, and this is the quality that distinguishes this uprising, the feminist uprising of bodies and figures. The feminist character of these protests is in opening the possibility of creating these figurative images. These images come icons reciprocally affect the desire to fill space with such images. I personally witnessed the desire to display bodies that wanted to be that figure, had seen that their bodies possessed the capacity to become that figure, bodies that therefore endangered themselves, entered the fray, struck that figure. In a field where there are few opportunities to take up space, they sought the chance to create moments of resistance. In truth, what distinguishes this surprising as feminist is this figure-centered character, the possibility of creating images that do not necessarily capture the intensity of conflict, the cruelty of repression, or the unfolding of events, but instead carry the history of bodies, a pause, an arrest. See this body, observe the entirety of this history, here. The figure of the torch-bearing woman, a self-sufficient carrier of history without reference to the seconds before or after it. The history of this body is not narrated in a linear temporal continuum on a video meant to represent repression or confrontation or action, but instead crystallizes in a revolutionary instant. Pause on the moment when the woman lifts her torched headscarf and flashes the sign of victory. The movement of eyes along the width of the image, the glare of the car's headlights behind her, the raised hands, the smiling face of the man standing to her right, the trees along the street, a figure. Pause. There is no need for the before and after of this moment in a video recording because the figure is created not in a temporal continuum but in a historic arrest, in a pause. There is where the heart of history stops beating for a second. What gives a photograph this astonishing power to stimulate as compared with a video? The time imprisoned in the photo. The time imprisoned in the photograph makes it dense, a carrier of the entire history in which that body has been subjugated. The uprising of women in Iran is a photo-centered uprising. What is it that extends this feminist trace and does not let it disappear? After Gina's name, after woman life freedom, while the volume of repression is so high that crowds often cannot take shape, 
it's the figures of women's resistance that continue to make this uprising a feminist uprising. This imprisoned time makes a linear narrative of history problematic and highlights in its stead a typology of the situation, the gestures, the moments, and the micro-struggle that we have been fighting every day. For that moment and all those moments. Not for that general narrative, but for everything small. For those fleeting micro-moments. For taking them back. For that lump in the throat. For that fear. For that excitement. For that word. For that instant that continues till now that has dragged itself to today, concealed itself under our skin, beneath our nails, in the lump of our throats. The present perfect. The time of the photographs is the present perfect. It arouses desires, brings the past to life, extends it until a second ago and in the moment of now. It hands the marathon of instants over to the next moment, the next photo, and the next figure. We had seen images of resisting women before. Pictures of the women's protection units, the YPJ in Syrian Kurdistan, for example. The difference between those photos and the figures of women in the recent protests is the centrality of the face in the former and the facelessness of the latter. The particularity of the first with its weapons and combat gear versus the generality of the second with its everyday attire. Close-ups of beautiful faces in the garb of resistance, the desire of the photographer, had given way to images of figures of resistance, the desire of the subject. I want you to see me this way. Images of uncovered hair with clenched fists. The figure of bodies on trash bins and automobiles. These figures recall Vida Movahed and other girls of Engelov Street. Vida seems to have been a turning point in the evolution of representations of Iranian women's struggle against the mandatory hijab. A departure point away from the message-centered, face-centered videos of White Wednesdays, mostly selfies of women walking on the street and saying something to explain the situation and their desires. Vida Movahed became the dense figure of all the videos before her that women had uploaded of walking without hijab. In contrast to these women, she was silent, fixed. The point of transition from video to photograph, a transition from the narration of an everyday circumstance to the creation of a truly historic situation. A shift from an individual speaking about herself and her desire to a silent, fixed figure, a figure of resistance. Here, the image of the protesting woman pulled herself out of the video's temporal continuum leaped away from the representation of everyday circumstance and landed on the dense stage of historic performativity. Vida Movahed, that unknown woman, was not Vida Movahed, but a picture of a revolutionary figure, the figure of all the women before her and a stimulus for women's figures after her. In an endless cycle, image and figure transform into one another. Images are published and distributed, and they arouse the imagination of bodies. People thereafter go to the street not with the bodies that they are, but with the bodies that they can and want to be. 
with their own imagination. Their revolutionary act is to incarnate this imagination. In truth, in this tying together of image and street, representation and reality mutually orient one another. Dream, representation, incarnation can impose itself on reality. Becoming that image and at the same time arousing the desire of other bodies to come. The chain of images, the short circuiting of the street with virtual space. Alongside these individual figures, we also witness collective figures. The circle of headscarf burning, the dance circle around the bonfire that traveled from Sari to other cities. We see the repetition of collective figures without it being possible anymore to determine the location to which each gathering belongs. In the initial days of the protests, a short video circulated of a small gathering of protesting women in Pave. A small and lonely group of women walking from the end of a street. This small group, whose gathering seemed highly perilous, appeared to me to be very similar to women's gathering in Afghanistan. That historic situation brings two images together, unites two collectives. Many images are never born because they are not taken. Numerous images never take because they do not give rise to a protest. How is it then that these specific figures took instead of being photographs that were taken? The figures took because they were a historic mirror for women, a thing that in place of the initial statement, I could also have been Gina, or in other words, I could also have died in the custody of the morality police, the image of the torch-bearing woman on the car aroused an intense desire that I also want to be that figure, the desire to express that figure of promise. And it was that figure that not only stimulated that desire, but drove women's bodies to express and to cleanse the rust from the mirror before them. Although this desire was stimulated through an image, it became a blossoming revolutionary desire by virtue of the history that the body carried. This figurative desire is the distinguishing feature of the feminist uprising, the outbreak of a repressed history, giving birth to a body we have been pregnant with for years. The figures we had seen previously of well-known politically active women forestalled the activation of political power and its distribution because they foregrounded the activists' faces and names. Faces and names aboard the figures' power to be arose the desires of other women because they rendered the situation of that figure different and special compared to the general situation of woman. Now the figure has freed itself from the bondage of the face. It is a general, faceless figure, covered with a mask, a face with reasons of security, an image shot from behind, nameless, anonymous. The political body of woman now circulates on the streets. From the beautiful body to the inspiring figure. From the body imprisoned in beauty to the body freed in the figure. This is not a transformation of the self into an ideal body, but the creation of a new figure of resistance each time and in every single body. While the body has been arose by and takes inspiration from previous figures whose images it has seen in virtual space, it creates a new figure and reciprocally inspires future figures. The chain of a stimulation and inspiration, this figure has released women from captivity in the body and its historic subjugation and has made the body flourish in its wake 
a body that has only now discovered the possibility, the beauty of its own resistance, maturing anew. Hey.